let's um, start with an easy one, uh, panel. And I'm going to turn to you first, Dan. It's just a real simple question. Tell us briefly the true home story, how you got into it, and where you are today. Sure. So as John said, and Jason uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, I am in the residential uh, real estate development and home building industry. I've been in it for 32 years and uh, began back in Indiana uh, in 2007. Uh, myself and my business partner moved to the Carolinas to uh, open up a home building company right before the markets uh, decided to collapse. 80% uh, uh, decrease in the number of people who are buying homes and a 20% decrease in the average sales price of homes as well. So it was an interesting time, but since then we've grown. Uh, today uh, we build in uh, five different geographic markets in the Carolinas, uh, build right at about 22, 2300 homes a year and have uh, 350 employees. So that's kind of, that's where we're at. And Dan, you have partners? I do. I have uh, uh, two partners. One, uh, my business partner, Mark Boyce, uh, he and I run uh, the company and we have a silent capital partner as well. Excellent. Steve, same question to you. Tell us a little bit about Kablaco. Uh, we're a second generation industrial coding company uh, headquartered in Denver. Um, we do uh, industrial projects, dams, bridges. Uh, we do a lot of work for DOT, that kind of stuff. I uh, grew up in our business with my father, and uh, I became sole owner in, in 2004. Uh, excellent. Excellent, Steve. Thank you. And Sam, a little bit different question, maybe a little bit about your client base and some of the work you've done with them. Well, um, again, as as uh, Jason introduced us, you know, I, I'm with CLA and I manage our private industries and the majority of our private industries clients are privately held businesses. So I focus 100 percent of my time on the business owner and helping them reach their goals. Um, John, I grew up in a small manufacturing community, uh, 650 people. My dad worked for a family owned business. Um, I got a passion for, you know, I worked in the business all through high school uh, from babysitting the owner's kids to running parts for that manufacturing company and got an inside look to what a family owned business really looks like and the dynamics that they're dealing with on a daily basis, whether it be, you know, um, things happening in the business or things happening in the family. So I found my way to CLA so I could focus on serving that business. So Again, 100% of my time is helping business owners like Dan and Steve reach their personal family goals through the business. So let's pick it up right there. Since the, the focus of this uh, webinar is to talk about the balancing of one, an owner's personal interests mm -hmm. with those of the business and the complications or maybe tension that come as a result of that, uh, Samantha, maybe I'll come right to you to talk about, you know, from a broad perspective, some of those considerations. Yeah, so I always, when, when I meet with a business owner, I always kind of step back at a 100,000 foot level and I say there's really three areas we need to focus on when we're doing planning. Oftentimes when we talk about strategic planning with a business owner, they go straight to the business. And I step back and say, really, there's three areas we need to focus on. The first thing is your own personal readiness business owner whatever that looks like. Um, and that could be personal readiness for the next five years, or uh, it could be for the next 10 years. And that means a lot of things, hopefully we'll be able to unpack that. The second thing is personal financial readiness. Everything that we should do in a strategic plan should be to make sure that the end outcome is that the business owner and the family are able to reach their goals. And goals could mean very different things to, to different people. And then the final thing is business readiness. We always encourage our business owners to think and develop a plan so that the business is always prepared for sale, whether you plan to sell that business or not, because what it does is create options. And again, increases the likelihood and opportunity mm -hmm for the family to reach those personal goals. And obviously there is gonna be that tension between the business and the personal plan because most oftentimes 80% of that value is sitting inside the business, John. And so sometimes there may be some debt or um, limited cash flow outside that business 
uh, and off and sometimes too much cash in the business or cash needed to grow and scale mm -hmm. the organization. So again, when we're planning, we always have to step back and say, what does that full picture look like? What are the things that we need to do and how can we remove the tension so that so all things feel balanced and equal. So we're not feeling tension and stress at home, or we're not feeling tension or stress within the business. It's really good. So let's use uh, Cabaleco and True Homes as a case study, if you will, for that framework. So Dan, I'm gonna come your way first. And first I want you to describe, if you would, the strategic vision and how you got to that for True Homes. In other words, where is it heading and what kind of readiness would you put on the table from it? Sure, and I think uh, I like Samantha's three circles of, of readiness. I think it's, it's a really good approach. I think to give our current uh, context, I have to go a little bit backwards in time, if that's okay, John. Uh, sure. Because when we started, and, and maybe the people who are uh, participating in this can, can relate, it was very much about just surviving. <laughs> I mean, we were very entrepreneurial. Um, we had been in the industry. We had worked for other uh, individuals, but it was kind of our time to say we felt like we wanted to step in and to uh, kind of do our own thing. And so very much, you know, had to take out of savings and live out of savings and, and uh, put money into the business, as Samantha mentioned. And our focus at that time was about a three to five year growth plan to get the business to a scale that was sustainable and we felt durable. And we had to get our banks on board for that. We we're gonna go through you know, three years of almost losses of making investment to get to scale. We had that signed off. And in our case, then we ran into the greatest housing recession in the history of the country. And so we became very flexible, very nimble, uh, our answer for most everything was yes. <laughs> if it could generate revenue, we would say yes. And so uh, cash flow, revenue generation, business uh, break even, uh, you know, we had to be above break even every single month or the banks were gonna pull our capital lines. In my world of residential real estate, it's a high capital based business. A lot of our risk resides on our balance sheet. Uh, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to do what we do today. but. Needless to say, we were just down, uh, like we like to say, John, digging our ditch every day and just making sure we were making progress. Uh, when we got to about 2012, 2013, the market started to improve and that gave us a new vision of, okay, we survived and actually we, we grew and we got a lot further down the road than we had anticipated. And we had captured a lot of value that we could then leverage to, to fuel our growth. So my, our three business partners, we made an agreement to grow the business uh, to a new level. We thought it would take three to five years and we were gonna retain the vast majority of all of our earnings uh, to grow the balance sheet so we wouldn't have to bring outside capital into the business. Uh, we did execute that plan. We were going through about 45, 50% a year growth for a good four or five years. But this is the critical thing for us, maybe just to wrap that up was we made a decision that we were going to cap our balance sheet. And so we said, we're gonna read, we're gonna invest over five years, but then unlike a lot of privates who just keep saying, I gotta keep growing the business, we said, we're gonna cap it. And then we're gonna let it throw off meaningful cash flow and significant dividends before we'd go through another growth phase. And so that was our plan. We executed that, we did, kick off significant dividends, which then kind of shifted for all of us, our personal financial plans, because now we had cash coming out of the business versus it all going into the business. And so today uh, it's a combination because we are a growth oriented company, but we always are looking at, uh, in our situation, we're not building our business to sell it. I could speak to that. We looked at that, but we're clearly keeping it to own it. And uh, we want it to be a cash generating business uh, that produces significant dividends and cash flow for the owners. So that's kind of our model. That's kind of where we're at today in the midst of that. Yeah, so you're tight. You've touched a little bit on the personal side. Let's just explore that just briefly before we go on to Steve. So the, the business, you survived, got it to stabilization started throwing off cash and instead of pouring it all back in, it became a more methodical capital plan. Why did you, why did you cap the balance sheet? And what was, how did the 
personal objectives fit into that? Yeah, it's a, it's a variety of things. One is what Samantha said was that so often in our industry, and I imagine there's people on this uh, webinar who could relate that so much of your net worth is tied up into your operating business. And if you ultimately wanna de-risk it or you wanna get chips off the table or you don't wanna continue to, to pump money in to grow the business, um, then you gotta sell it. Well, we purposely said we didn't want to do that. So by nature, we said we're going to get chips off the table without selling it called a cap balance sheet. So we didn't have to keep reinvesting our earnings back into the business. And so when we started to do that, then that created uh, a lot of opportunity for diversification. And then that's when really, I would say for my wife and I and our family, that's when our personal planning. We've always had financial plan. We've always been very uh, disciplined in that personally, but things went to a new level. Um, and one of my philosophies was I'm fine keeping my money that's in the business at, at high risk, but anything that comes out of the business, I want to make sure I don't lose. And so um, I grew up in a manufacturing agricultural uh, town, much like you, Samantha. And so my uh, grandparents and my stepdad are farmers. And so John knows, I would say, I want to fill up my silos uh, in the years that there were good harvest. And that's what we've done. And so then been very conservative. And then today, you know, we're looking up and now we're getting into, you know, generational wealth transfer. And it's kind of been an unbelievable ride. But the last thing I'd say, John, to answer your question is in, in our journey, and I imagine there's others who can relate, you know, the personal financial sides of things, it went very slow and then it happened very fast. And that's kind of our story. We went from, you know, you know, very successful business, but financially it was slow. And then all of a sudden it was very fast. And so we had very good advisors um, uh, from CLA in this case, who were really in front of us knowing what would happen to help us uh, kind of navigate into uh, a really good position uh, five years ahead of where I was thinking at that time. Mm, very good. So Steve, thank you for being so patient. We'll come in your direction with a similar question about your company's vision and then your personal vision. So maybe a little different story. I, I grew up in our business and so uh, my vision was my father's vision. And that was a lot like what Dan talked about, just uh, trying to make payroll, trying to do right by the people that worked hard for us. Um, he made, you know, pretty good living and was able to put some stuff away. Um, when I took over the business, um, for the first 10 years, my dad was the bank. He financed everything. And so um, I worked really hard not to disappoint my banker. I, I, I doubled down and I still wanted invitations for Sunday dinners, right? So I had to pay my bills. Um, and during that time, uh, probably out of necessity, um, I just tried to surround myself with good mentors. And I formed an advisory board, people who had gone through family business, people who had grown and sold their business, or people like Dan who had decided to hold on. And they really helped me uh, strategically hire some some people that were I mean, smarter than I was, did had different expertise, did different things. And so my management team, um, I'm the only one that is really from our industry. Um, and, and that has helped me in our vision going forward. You know, as it, as it goes now, um, Colorado's not a very industrial town per se or state and so we've geographically had to spread out we've got good customers who uh, general contractors who kind of drag us around the country we perform in one state and they drag us to another and that's relationships is huge in our in our business and so i work really hard daily to keep those um we talk about our personal readiness uh i too have been a longtime CLA client and um, the business transition team has really been impactful for me uh, from spending time with my family and my management team um, and trying to look what the next generation looks like. I have 
two children that right now don't profess to want to be in the business, but we hope maybe someday they will. But it's um, the, the biggest problem we have right now is our labor market. And so we have to do everything we possibly can to keep the good people we have. And that doesn't just come through paychecks. Uh, you talk about, Dan was talking about dividends for um, him and his family. I, I practice the same thing out of my business. Um, and I think it could be more in that fine line for me is how much is enough versus trying to reward those who are keeping me going every day. Yeah. Do you find that to be a point of tension? Uh, personally, yeah, I mean, it's, um, yes, it is. I have, I have a pretty good life. I, I get to do kind of some fun stuff every now and then. I, I think I work really hard to do that. And, um, but I know that there are people in my organization who are doing the same thing I was doing 10 years ago, trying to save to put their kids in college, trying to save for their daughter to get married, take a good vacation. And that, that, that makes me not sleep some nights. Yeah. So how do you find, yeah, I was going to, there you go. So how do you find peace with that point of tension? Well, how much do I take versus what do I leave in the company? Um, sure. And that place of personal ready, financial readiness versus the business financial readiness facing some very significant challenges. I never want to be embarrassed about what I do. And so if I take a vacation, um, I don't ever want to be embarrassed about telling my team or anyone who works for me where I went and what I did. And so I use that as kind of a barometer for me um, as to if I'm taking too much time or if I'm doing things that um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say lavish, but are things that uh, we we employ craft workers, technicians, hardworking, boots and jeans kind of people. And um, so I, I use that as my barometer. That's good. That's a, that's a great, great litmus test. Yeah. Dan, how about you? How do you manage that tension uh, to the extent? It exists. Yeah, much like Steve, um, one of our four core values at True Homes that existed before we started the business was people. And so we highly value people. Another one of our four core values is sustainability. And, and part of this, this is, I like to say, it's not just the sustainability of the business, it's the sustainability of our people. And, um, and Steve, and I know that there's others who are gonna be on this as well, listening that for many years, uh, uh, we didn't make anything and we made sure our associates got paid. And, you know, when we finally came out of the great housing recession, you know, the first bonuses for just loyalty, uh, went out to all of our associates because we wanted to say thank you. And, 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 you know, if you don't have your people, you don't have a company. And in our case, we wanted to keep it and we really care about people deeply. And so for us, it's always been about like for our executive team. Um, it's been important to uh, myself and my business partner that the executives uh, got paid the same way that owners do. They get paid mm -hmm. out of wealth creation and, and they get paid extremely well and they get paid just like an owner does. Uh, mm -hmm. They have very low base salaries. They have very high profit sharing. And so if the business is profitable and, and we can uh, distribute dividends. They get paid as well. So that model's worked very well for us. Um, but you're right. It's, but honestly, for me, it's, um, like at True Homes, we're right now, everybody knows housing's getting ready and is getting hammered. Um, you know, we went from the crazy best, hottest market and I've ever been in in 32 years to, you know, 6% interest rates slow things down really quick. But everybody in our company knows that the number one goal, you can ask any of our 350 associates, the number one goal that we share is uh, the preservation of everybody's jobs. And so that is the number one goal it, it is in our industry for, for true homes. It's not the industry norm, it's our norm. And so because of that, we've already made the big decision, John. We made the decision that our associates are gonna get rewarded before ownership gets rewarded. Um, we've, we've, we've been able to create wealth and, um, and much like Steve said, we want our employees to be able to still save for their, 
kids college. We want to be able to go on a vacation. We want them to be able to own one of our homes that we build. And so uh, very much want to be good stewards over what's created out of the business and make sure it's going back to the people who are uh, creating what we do every day. It's excellent. John, can I jump in there a little bit? Yeah, I was actually going to come your direction. And uh, yes, absolutely. You know, um, living to an organization's values is uh, is a necessity, right? It, it It's what builds the culture of the organization and the longevity. Um, what I always tell business owners when we're having this conversation, because many of the privately held businesses we work with are exactly like Dan and Steve, focused on people, focus on taking care of them. And I always see my job as, as taking care of the business owners. And what I always tell them is they need to put their oxygen mask on first. Because if something ever happens to the business, who is the, and, and the bank isn't willing to be at the table to put the money into the business, guess who's next in line? That is the business owner. So to take care of the employees, to take care of the organization, what we always say is, yes, there's always that healthy tension and it needs to be balanced and it needs to tie to the values that the organization and the business owners have, but put your oxygen mask on first. Let's make sure to de-risk yourself and get some value off the table, even if it's just a little bit, even if it's just a little bit on a quarterly or annual annual basis, because if it's ever needed, Dan, you go into that recession, right. the, the housing industry gets hit, the, the business owners are flexible and financially healthy mm -hmm. enough to step in, lean in and say, listen, we're gonna get ourselves through this hard time. Um, and so again, it's it's this really healthy balance that I think business owners have to have to face. And behind that balance, behind that tension is the risk. Steve highlighted the risk of retaining people today, such a critical element of it. Dan, you're highlighting the market risks. There's all kinds of other business risks that we face every day. Sam, you're, you're highlighting the need for, a, for an, a business owner to manage their personal risk. Do you mind uh, digging into that just a little bit more when you talk about managing that and putting one's oxygen mask on first before helping the person next to them? What does that really mean? And how does a business owner approach that? Sure. So this is always a hard topic because you're getting to know a business owner, you're having a conversation and say, well, now we have to talk about risk. And the first question is, well, what is? what do you mean by that? Well, death, divorce, disability, <laughs> disagreement and distress. So pretty depressing topics, but it is always the conversation that we need to have first, because again, we got to put the oxygen mask on, on the business owner first. So, you know, simple things that we always want to talk about is, do we have a diversification plan for you in the business? I know, you know, like you said, Dan and Steve, you were building the business. A lot of capital is required in that business. So um, is there a way that we can start diversifying your financial risk? back to the picture of most times value is all in the business that creates risk. So any little bit that we can take out and put in a safe place is important. The second thing we talk about are just simple things like insurance, insurance, uh, disability, life insurance. We talk about living wills. Um, it, those are the things that we just at a basic level always need to evaluate as a business owner to say, I need to make sure everything is taken care of for me because if something happens to me, it would it could have a risk for the business and all the employees working for that business. So that's where we always start. Uh, the five Ds, death, disability, divorce. Uh, disagreement and distress. What do we have in place to manage those five things? I know, depressing. I'm sorry. Gotta throw them out there. And then, and then, do we have just the general housekeeping in place to make sure that you know there's nothing missing in a plan? Mm, that's great. Steve comments on that topic and how you personally manage the risk and balance those. Uh, a lot of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, you know, the, the first thing is if you're, if you have a spouse, um, my wife is not in our business, but she, I was taught this from my father. Um, I tell her everything that goes on in the business. So there's no surprises there. Um, we, we successfully kind of navigated through the pandemic when all of our uh, travel was basically 
shut off. At that time, Colorado, we were not um, doing a lot of work in state. We were traveling. And so we, <clears throat> we had to travel and we could no longer put four or five guys in a truck. We put one guy in one truck and we drove four trucks and we didn't have shared rooms. We had multiple rooms. Oh. And so our, our cost, we couldn't go back to our contracts and say, you know, we need relief on this. So we poured out a lot of, of capital in the beginning just to keep our people whole. And I didn't, you know, take a paycheck for a little bit. And my wife was prepared for that. And we talked about that. So I think uh, I've heard Sam's speech before, uh, not yeah. only by her, but by some of her um, <laughs> people she works with. Lisa, Lisa gives me that speech quite often. So um, I think number one, you have to communicate that and it's, and it should be with your spouse or it should be with your partner. However, however that works for you. The other thing is there needs to be some transparency with your management team. Your management team has to know uh, what's going on. Now I don't have any partners. And so you, there's also a little bit of tension there as to how much do I tell uh, you know, non-owners, right? Uh, if I don't have partners, but I try to be as, transparent as I possibly can. So when when we have big events, we're prepared. And it's not, there is no tension. Yeah, good. That's great. Well, transparency relieves tension at the end of the day, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Dan, how about you? Well, for us, um, I'd say th there's a different types of risk as Samantha said, but let me start with maybe with the business risk, just the practical nature of that and our risk typically resides heavily on the balance sheet and um, we, are, we have hundreds of millions of dollars of, of balance sheet investment and so you know when you're I like to say when you play high stakes poker which is residential real estate development and home building that takes hundreds of millions of dollars to do what you do and you've got meaningful equity in and meaningful debt I mean you got you got it on both sides um, you better manage the risk of that balance sheet because uh, that's where it is. And so there's high levels of discipline. Um, and I would say it, another area of that is is constraints, you know, constraining yourself to say, hey, you've got to always be prepared, not for the peak, but you got to be prepared for the valley. And uh, in our business, we we were we originated in the valley um, and we rode up the peak, but we never forgot about the valley. And so, you know, I'm personally very excited about the, the change in the home building and, and housing market right now, uh, because we've been prepared for it for years. And so, you know, we have uh, meaningfully prepared personally uh, to make sure, as Samantha said, that we can bring chips back onto the table um, that we took off. Uh, we know that we've got dry powder. Uh, we also have business planning that's completed well in advance of all of this. So we're executing now on plans that we created years ago. Um, and so we're very fluidly rolling right now. I'd say when you go back to the balance sheet, then the other risk that we've had as owners and, and business partners would be an unexpected death and, uh, and a big tax event that would go back onto uh, one of us off of our estates. And so making sure we've really thought through that um, and making sure that there's not a big capital call that would come back on the business because all of a sudden there's a big tax bill that's due. And so that's, that's an area of risk also that we feel great about today, that we've been creating strategies and tactics across all three of us, because unlike Steve, you know, there's three of us that are involved. And so we have to have that coordinated uh, approach uh, to make sure that we've all thought through the dynamics of what happens when things don't go well. And, and so CLA, again, has played a, a critical role in helping us all get on the same page. Although we may play slightly different uh, games, we're all playing off the same playbook. And so risk is, and I agree with Steve, lots, lots of, uh, you know, <laughs> therapy. <laughs> uh, 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 anyway, so yeah, anyway, so risk is a big part of it and you've got to always be managing the risk. So I'm struck um, as the, two of you in particular, Steve and Dan, talk about the management of risk. You're weaving back and forth between your personal risk and the business risk, and then back and forth again. 
Um, Dan, in particular, you referenced a uh, business plan that was on the books for years. I think what you really are referencing is a contingency plan because it wasn't a business plan. It was one that you knew you were going to put in place if you hit it. Part of the business readiness. How did you go about assembling that? And, and what are some of the high level components? And if you do that relatively quickly, I want to move on to some other topics, but I think that'd be really helpful for this crew. Well, you know, I'm in a cyclical industry. In my career, I've gone through eight recessions. Um, the greatest of those was, you know, for five years and the markets dropped 80%. And so if you're going to do what I do by nature, you need to have contingency planning and you need to know what happens. You know, our industry doesn't go through a recession. Our industry goes through a depression. We go through a 20% plus drop when it goes bad. And so you got to prepare for that. And so we've had strategic and tactical plans. And John, what I would just say, and I think it's relevant for the, the, the those who are listening to this, it's there's things you have to do and you can only do when the business is going well. Right. We call those peak practices. If you don't implement the peak practices and put some constraints on yourself, you won't have that powder available in the valley response. And so it's balancing those things and there's things you can only do in either either one of those dynamics. And so it's just thinking through and preparing for those. Excellent, excellent. I wanna move on to governance really again, this management of that personal and business interest. And uh, if, I, if we can explore the, Steve, the advisory board that you assembled, that's a best practice of sorts that not every, closely held business employees. Would you mind talking about it, how you put it together, how you use it, how much authority you give them, et cetera? Well, <clears throat> um, I did it because I, I just, I, I knew that I didn't have the answers. And, and this was before I had a relationship with um, a really good firm um, like CLA that advises me on a lot of different things. And so uh, I had a good friend that I was in a book club with and he had just taken over uh, his father's business, you know, years past and had just sold it. And, and I was talking to Rick and he said, um, you know, I really wish I would have had some people around me when I first started. The, 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 the tensions in, I uh, go back to that for just a second. The tension that I had in, in my work world was not only with business, but was with my family. I had to work for and satisfy my father and my mother as I took over the business. So I needed some counsel outside of my father. So uh, I just started asking people. And I think um, one of the things that I've learned is some vulnerability in owning a business and and you have to ask when you don't know and you have to be willing to um, kind of put yourself out there personally to to get some advice. We meet quarterly. Um, I'm very transparent. Um, I don't pay them. I give them like a gift, you know, to every now and then, but I don't pay them and they have no real governance over the company, except um, I show up prepared because I don't want to be embarrassed. That's mainly it. Yeah, that's good. It's an excellent, excellent practice. Let's stay on this topic of uh, governance, if you will, and how you manage the different elements of it. Dan, a question came in for you. You peaked a couple of things. One was related to the silent partner and the business partner and how you've approached managing those relationships because there's an element of risk. I think you implied some of it as you started talking about what if one of them dies. But if you wouldn't mind, just kind of talk about how you ex continue to explore it. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. And and in all honesty, I couldn't have two better partners. Uh, uh, I've got great, great business partners um, and one, uh loves the loves the business um he's been around it his whole life uh but he does not have any ever any input into the home building operation he's not an operator uh but he loves the business and you know he, as long as we are going out and we are doing what we say we do 
Um, he'll continue to want to invest more in the business. He'll continue to want to uh, move forward. And my other business partner, he and I run the business every day. And so we have, and to that point, as, as, as we got through survival mode and as we got into growth mode, we have had become more formal in our communication with each other and more current with our communication with each other uh, because um, there are uh, a lot of things that are going on in the midst of the business. And, 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 and like Steve, he's got some outside, I've got some inside uh, dynamics that really work well for us from a conversation standpoint on where the business is at and where we wanna take the business. And then we, we, we tend to operate in kind of a three to five year vision of saying, hey, where do we wanna take the business over the next the three to five years? And then we focus on operating and executing against those plans. It's excellent, excellent, Dan, thank you. Um, Samantha, can we stay on this topic um, of governance? And I wanna talk about family dynamics for just a moment ago, moment if I can. I won't put um, Steve or Dan on the spot yet with this one, but you, because that's a touchy one. I'm people trying to decide, do I bring the kids into the business? Do I not? Do I engage them and involve them or do I not? And how might that work? So could you just kind of talk about how that 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 tension of managing personal and business plays out well, uh, from I a fast practice perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, what Steve said was it hit me when he was talking about, you know, staying connected with his children and understanding their interest. I think it's always good to have transparent conversations with the family about their interest in being involved. And, you know, if it's one family being in, involved in the ownership, that that's easy. If there's multiples family, if family members, you know, brothers involved in the business, sisters involved in the business, it gets a little tricky. So, uh, one, we always talk about having extremely transparent conversations about interest, and those interests can change, you know, from the time they're in high school through getting out of college and or or in the workforce. So again, keeping um, an open dialogue and a process to have that communication. The second thing we always encourage with family-owned businesses is to not only have those board of advisors that are not made up fully of the family, but having family charters family participation plans. Family participation plans are, are very clear guidance that the family has decided on is if you are in the business, this is the expectations that we have. And this is how we're gonna interact and communicate with each other. And if we get outside of bounds, we're gonna have an open and honest dialogue about it. A family charter is the goals and objectives as the family inside the business and outside the business. Um, Cause oftentimes there's things that the family wants to do together to continue to build the relationship and how does the business build into that? So again, um, there are a lot of ways to um, navigate family dynamics and try to you know, increase uh, communication and decrease conflict. But those are two things I think about, oh, well, three things. One, the board of advisors, uh, to the family charter, and then three, the, the family participation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you mentioned earlier the kids aren't necessarily um, engaged today, and yet you're somewhat preparing a path up for potential or something of that nature. How are you looking at that from a family perspective? So we did, <clears throat> we did the family charter. We did uh, an exercise where Lisa came into our home and spent a couple days with my children and my wife and interviewed them and found out if they were interested, what their time frames were. Um, and so we meet quarterly as a family and we review that and we kind of see where they are. I have a, my son lives in Seattle and is a CPA and my daughter's a social worker in Denver. So I have, they're on two different spectrums for sure. Um, makes dinner quite interesting sometimes, but um, <clears throat> we just ask them as often as we can. Um, and, you know, I guess I'll just say it like it is, right? Um, my wife and I don't really agree on that most of the time. She wants her children back and she thinks it'll be awesome if they're in the business. And I remember how difficult and and um, how trying that was on my family. So um, I think time will tell. We're prepared if it happens. It is something that I talk about my with my executive management team about. Uh, they know that if 
one of the kids decides they want to come work, then there's going to be a spot. Now, they're going to have to work. We have, you know, a path already laid out for that, what that looks like. Um, but again, I just think you have to, you have to continue to talk about that as often as you can. That's excellent. Dan? Well, where our dynamics are a little bit different, uh, we've got three different families, right? And so, um, and, and in all sincerity, where we've landed and where we feel really good about it today is, and we all have, for all practical purposes, young adult or adult kids. And uh, kind of the principle is that uh, the best thing for uh, the, the kids is to have the very best people leading the business. Because ultimately, the kids are the ones who will ultimately take be owners in the business. And so we've very much focused on dynamics of ownership versus operations and uh, in equipping and empowering the kids around understanding how to be good owners and how to good, be good investors, how to assess business risk, how to assess talent, how to be able to know whether you've got the right uh, leadership team in place. And so that'll be a multiple year journey with them. But that's where we're focused is on equipping and empowering them around the dynamics of owning a business versus running a business. Now, if any of our kids want to get in at some level, uh, you know, they know that, yeah, my son, for example, he's a frontline building supervisor. He's out there in the booty, you know, dirty boots every day. Is there any path for him to run the business? No, um, that we don't. That's not how we're viewing it. Uh, others have got their kids involved, but nobody's viewing it from the standpoint that there's going to be a direct transfer of a family member running the business. The families will own the business, and we want the best people running the business. Hmm. That's very good. Let me uh, uh, wrap it up here with one final question uh, around future leaders and how you manage the ultimate risk of sustainability. I think you said that earlier, Dan, and and Steve, you were talking about the engagement of your management team in a transparent perspective, but also there's this dynamic of being able to step back from the business and act as an owner, as opposed to an operator that wears many of the hats. How are you, how are you looking at that, Steve, as you're looking at the generation of leaders or, and your ability to step back, if you will, and think work more on the business than in the business? I've, I've got two really good young guys, younger than I am, who are leading our business from one in a finance uh, side of thing and one in a operational side of things. And I, I empower them. I allow them to make mistakes. I try not to step in and, and, and make decisions for them. Um, but they, and I liked what Dan said about it. My children know that uh, if they were to come work for me, they would not immediately, you know, run the business. They would work for these two gentlemen that I have um, been working with. And so I think as I step back or I try to step back, I'll, I'll work remote a little bit more. I'll take some more vacations, uh, maybe some extended time away. Um, but I will equip them as best I can. I've got them in leadership training from a CLA outside source. And um, there's some objectives that they have to meet in order to uh, get to the next level as well. Yeah, awesome. Dan. Well, um, leadership development and uh, succession has always been kind of a core just lane of, of how we think as a business. Um, so we've, uh, it begins, I think, I would say it's a multi-phased approach. And, and what I would say is the first one is when you're down and you're running the business every day, you're running the business every day. You are the operator, right? You are hands-on. And if you can't ever get out of that mode, then you kind of only leave yourself into a, in my opinion, a sale event. Um, and then the person who's going to come in, either if they're not already in the industry and they just want to absorb you, then they're going to say, well, who's running this place and who's making them, who's driving P and L. And if it's you and it's only you, you're in trouble. And so I think in my journey and our journey, what we said, even with our executive team was, Hey, we've got to step back a few notches and become overseers 
and not purely operators and ensure that we're still running the business well. But so we uh, focused on equipping and empowering a whole nother level of leaders uh, around the dynamics of, of running one of our, our businesses. And so that's been a five year journey. And I'll tell you, they've blown me away. They're, 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 they're just, uh, I'm so shocked at how, not, I shouldn't say shocked, that's terrible. I'm pleased, I'm incredibly pleased uh, with the strength that they've demonstrated. Well, then that embeds more strength deeper down into the business, which yeah. allows uh, us to, to have a little bit more distance. And then the next phase is uh, stepping even further back. And, and, and what I would say that I'm working on for myself today and others is, I think you gotta pull the trigger sooner than later. Uh, and the reason I say that is, is that if I wait too long and I get the person wrong, then I got to stay in much longer because I got to recreate that person. Yeah. That so if I start, if I find somebody I'm excited about, and then I can invest and spend meaningful time with that person while I'm still in the business and not outside the business, then I leave myself the option that if I get that person wrong or that I find they're not the right person, I can still pivot. So I think in my case, I love what I do, but I'm already starting to look for somebody to tap, but I'm gonna work with that person for a meaningful period of time. So I get to know who they are as a person, get to know their heart as well as their head. Yeah, fantastic. Sam. You know, I, I look at uh, really what drives uh, the value of a business and there's really four buckets, the human capital, the customer capital, structural capital and social capital. And what you're talking about in the future leaders is that human capital, the leadership bench strength that a business owner really needs to focus on. Because again, Dan and, and Steve are critical elements to the business. And like Dan said, if you know, uh, uh, whether it's a transition to family and outside third party, whatever that transition looks like, um, the next owners need to be able to operate that business without the business owner involved. So development of those future leaders is really critical. So I always tell the business owner to step back and think about this. And this is huge for their own personal readiness. But I think about it as a hub and spoke approach. I always say, hey, what are the things that you are making decisions on? Write them all down. What cannot get done within your organization or as an owner that 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 no one but you can do? Write it all down and start prioritizing it and saying, who in my organization can I trust to help transition that to and start? Like Dan said, while I'm there, I can oversee and help make sure it's managed. So it, it creates it goes from a hub to a spoke where there's more people that are able to be active within the business and helping make decisions or active as an owner group and making those decisions. And eventually over time, you'll be able to pull yourself back from it. But again, takes time, takes energy, takes effort. There may be times where you say, well, listen, I have this list of stuff that I don't have the right person for. Well, that may be, hey, I need to build that individual from within the organization, or I need to go get that individual to help make sure that I'm protecting the value uh, for myself and for the owners. So, excellent. That helps, John. That's excellent. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in. I want to get to those if we can. The first one I'm going to put up, I'm going to just read it verbatim for you. Um, if the panelists were joining a startup or a scale up today, where they were being asked to wear multiple hats at the ground level, relationships, logistics, sales, et cetera. But the owner of the business is quite older. Um, what contingencies would they ensure to have in place in case that owner, who they're taking it from, can, uh, can run the business um, no longer for X, Y, Z reasons? In other words, at that, if you go all the way back to the beginning, when you stepped in, what are the first contingencies you would have worked on to make sure we're in place? I think they're looking for some prioritization. Dan? That's a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. It really is. I was going to say, Steve, what do you think? <laughs> I would uh, absolutely find a good attorney. I would find uh, a good accountant. Um, I would find... Um, To, to pri if, if I'm coming in and I mean, it sounds a little bit like what I was doing with my father there. Um, the, the hardest thing about coming into a business, whether it be as an owner or a new manager or anyone, 
is to have the people who work for you respect for you, respect you for what you can do. Uh, a lot of times people just come in and they have a title and people don't understand why they're there or what they do. So they have to have the connection with the people first. They, I mean, it, the reason Dan has made it through is because his people followed him through the hard times. I mean, that's that's the truth of it all. If 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 he wasn't a guy that <clears throat> his people didn't believe in, he wouldn't have a company. And so I think you have to make the connection with the employees first. Absolutely. Excellent. Dan, now, did you get a chance to think about it? No, I, I agree with Stephen. I think, you know, he, here's, here's the other side I would say is, and I've seen this multiple times and I've experienced it at a time in my career is, one thing is the plan for the downside. What happens if it goes bad? But the other thing you got to prepare for, what if it goes good? Because I have seen individuals that when you're starting up, I, I know individuals and you have, you're just, you're excited. Maybe it's your first leadership opportunity. Maybe it's the first time you're going to get some level of equity if the business, you know, happens. And if you're the person who's going to go make a lot of it happen, you need to negotiate on the front end to make sure that you get the value that you're going to create. Because what tends to happen is if you go create that value mm. and the other person there really didn't create the value and the business scales, and now all of a sudden you're saying, well, but I created all this value and I'm not getting the payday mm. and the other person's getting the payday. I'm not getting you this value and I have all the responsibility and they're getting all the reward. So just make sure not only are you thinking about the downside, you're also preparing, what if this thing goes really well? and think about those future dynamics. And that's one of the things I always give advice to people because you know what, if somebody's doing a startup, it's easier to give uh, more away before you have any of it than it is after you have it. And mm. so don't forget that negotiating principle. That's excellent. Sam, we have a little less than two minutes to go. Any advice for this group? We just got some great advice from Steve and Dan. Yeah, I'll go. I mean, I think the, I, I don't want to duplicate the answers that they gave to that question. I mean, the advice that I would give to the business owners, regardless of where you're at in your journey, your age um, as a business owner and leader, uh, planning now is critical um, because all of these things that we talked about today take time and effort and uh, advisors. And I say advisors plural because there is not one person that can take you through this journey. So uh, uh, accumulating your team is take time, takes time. Um, and so I would just say, give it time, start now. And the first thing you should always mm -hmm. do is de-risk yourself and your business as much as possible. Protect yourself and your family um, and your legacy. So mm -hmm. that's my advice. Excellent. There are so many takeaways from this conversation, everybody. It started at the beginning when Samantha laid out the three areas to focus on, your personal emotional readiness, your personal financial readiness, and the business financial readiness. It progressed as we talked about the diversification plan and how one steps back to make sure you understand the risks in the business, outside the business, where those coincide or, or um, uh, or, or, or collide and where they um, uh, intersect. Transparency with the management team and stepping back when the next generation or the next level produces. But the key message here is work at it, plan for it, and, uh, and engage your team in the process. I want to give everybody a th uh, thanks, the panelists. Well done. Really appreciate it, all of you.